Welcome to Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library Podcast. My name is Demi Schwartz, a Hufflepuff. My name is Jessica Minecci, a Ravenclaw. It's time to turn on the light because Hogwarts is about to welcome you home. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 10 of Lumos Maxima. Jess, can you believe it that we reached double digit episodes? I can't believe it. And you know what? By the time this episode airs, we will have been podcasting for four months already. That's crazy. And we just reached a thousand plays. Can you believe this? I'm completely shocked. Thank you guys who listened. And if you're new here, welcome. If you have been here before, welcome back. We're so excited to have you. If you guys haven't already, feel free to follow us on social at Lumos Maxima Cast on Twitter and Instagram and Lumos Maxima the Rolling Library Podcast on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel, which is Lumos Maxima the Rolling Library Podcast, where we post bonus content. Also, we have a voicemail line, which is 412-228-5435. So drop us a voicemail and we will include it in a future episode. Speaking of, we have a voicemail from our number one fan, Maddie, in regards to episode number eight, which was about Neville Longbottom. Let me start off by saying, guys, y'all did amazing on your Neville episode. This is exactly why he's one of my favorite characters. Y'all did awesome. Fantastic. I love it. And this is probably my favorite episode so far. I really connected with this one. So thank you so so very much i really was touched by this one and i just was curious if y'all were taking suggestions i'd like to see a episode on dobby i would love that so if y'all are looking for ideas for an episode i really hope y'all consider doing dobby anyway i hope y'all have a wonderful day and i love you guys so very much y'all are absolutely amazing Thank you so much, Maddie. As everybody knows, I adore Neville, and hearing your awesome comments about how much you love Neville's episode means the world to me, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And in regards to your question about a Dobby episode, we are actually planning one for October. So to me, since this is your episode, what is our topic? Our topic is happy birthday, Harry Potter, because this episode drops on Harry's birthday, which is crazy ironic and awesome yeah like we did not plan this <laughs> but it worked out for us and with that let's get into the latest issue of the rolling library magazine awesome sauce let's take a glimpse into the articles in the latest issue of the rolling library magazine issue number 43 of the rolling library magazine contains some really interesting articles the first article is called the big six translations of harry potter The article talks about the most elusive and hard to find foreign translations of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The next article is called The Wand Didn't Choose the Wizard, Neville Longbottom and His Dad's Wand. This article was written by one of your hosts, Demi, so definitely go check it out. In this article, Demi talks about the significance of Neville using his dad's wand throughout the series and how Neville's time at Hogwarts would have been different if he had had his own wand, a wand that chose him. The next article is called The Boy Who Dreamed. This article talks about the theory that Harry dreamed everything that occurred in the books and how that dream parallels everything he experienced in the muggle world. The author also discusses parallels between J.K.'s life and the books she dreamed up. The next article is called The Draw Who Lived. This article tells the story of Paul Piero, the artist behind the Draw Who Lived Instagram account. Paul uploads a new drawing of a different Harry Potter character every day and sends them to the Harry Potter movie actors. He sends them two drawings, one to sign and one to keep. While J.K. Rowling admitted that she likes his drawings, Paul's dream is to get her to sign one someday. Good luck, Paul. The next article is my article. It is called 20 Years of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. My article was written in celebration of the 20-year anniversary of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, which was released on July 8, 2000. 
I dive into more detail about the book release day and discuss the casting of the first movie, which was happening at the time Goblet of Fire hit the shelves. The last article is called Wave a Wand, Ron Weasley. This article dives into Ron's wand. From talking about the wand Ron uses in the movies and its replica for the Noble Collection to why Ron's wand seems to be the least popular of the wands of the Golden Trio, the author covers it all. Also, the article shares Ollivander's notes on Ron's two wands, and there's an interesting connection between his first wand, which used to be Charlie's, being broken from the Whomping Willow incident, and his second wand, which is made of willow wood. How fascinating. Now, let's go to Demi with the quote by Joe. Here's Joe's quote. I love freakish names and I have always been interested in folklore, and I think it was a logical thing for me to end up writing, even though it came so suddenly. July 2005. And now let's get into our quote about Harry's birthday. It's time for Quick Quotes Corner. The quote for Harry's birthday comes from Chapter 1 of Prisoner of Azkaban called Owl Post. Extremely unusual though he was, at that moment Harry Potter felt just like everyone else, glad for the first time in his life that it was his birthday. On Harry's 13th birthday, he gets presents and birthday cards for the first time ever. Growing up with the Dursleys, Harry never had a birthday celebration. He was lucky enough if the Dursleys even acknowledged the fact that it was his birthday. And even if he does get presents, they aren't that great. Like when they gave him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks for his 10th birthday. But now, getting presents from Ron, Hermione, and Hagrid, Harry is realizing that the magical people in his life truly love and care about him. And now that he's found a home with them at Hogwarts, he has people who want to make his birthdays special. This is so true, and for most kids, birthdays are a time of fun and celebration. You get cake and ice cream and presents, and Harry never had that growing up. He was made to feel like he was absolutely worthless, and the fact that people actually think he's worth something is super baffling to him. Also, here, Harry is finally getting to experience being a real kid. Absolutely. And hey, look, it's Polly bringing Harry some birthday presents. Actually, it's our news. <laughs> hey, it's Polly, our owl. She's bringing us the wizarding news in the muggle world. The first piece of news is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone readings. Three families of Harry Potter fans and a surprise cameo read Chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces. Listen to all the readings on the Wizarding Worlds podcast on Spotify. Harry Potter at Home Readings, Harry Potter and the Philosophers slash Sorcerer's Stone. Next, we have Vera Bradley and Warner Brothers Consumer Products unveil Harry Potter plus Vera Bradley collection. Vera Bradley Incorporated and Warner Brothers Consumer Products announced that they will be selling a Harry Potter inspired capsule collection. This collection includes backpacks, handbags, travel duffels, cozy favorites, and more. Vera Bradley's bright, colorful style is paired with symbols from the Harry Potter film series. Purchase products from the exclusive Home to Hogwarts pattern, or select pieces in patterns named and styled after each Hogwarts house, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. These versatile styles also feature hidden surprises and pockets full of wonder. You can find the Harry Potter plus Vera Bradley collection in Vera Bradley full-line stores, Vera Bradley retailers, and on www.verabradley.com. Stay informed about the collection by following at Vera Bradley and at Harry Potter and using the hashtag, hashtag Harry Potter x Vera Bradley. Lastly, we have the Magic Continues with Harry Potter x Pandora collection. The jewelry company Pandora just released six new charms inspired by the Harry Potter universe. These charms include the Harry Potter Glasses, Nimbus 2000, and Lightning Bolt Dangle Charm, the Harry Potter Deathly Hollows Dangle Charm, the Harry Potter Sorting Hat Charm, the Harry Potter Hedwig Owl Dangle Charm, the Harry Potter Open Work Harry Potter Icons Charm, and the Harry Potter Hogwarts Acceptance Letter Dangle Charm. 
Check these charms out along with the rest of the collection at us.pandora.net. Now, let's go to Demi with Harry Potter birthday news. I'm here with Harry Potter birthday news. So Harry James Potter was born on July 31st, 1980 in Godric's Hollow. His parents were James and Lily Potter. Harry's birthday is very significant in terms of the prophecy. The opening lines read, The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born to those who have thrice defied him, born as the seventh month dies, meaning the end of July. Harry shares his birthday with J.K. Rowling herself. Rowling was born on July 31st, 1965 in Bristol, England. Rowling isn't the only one to share her birthday with Harry. Richard Griffiths, who played Vernon Dursley in the movies, was also born on July 31st. Daniel Jacob Ratcliffe, who plays Harry Potter in the movies, also has a July birthday. Daniel was born on July 23rd, 1989, making his birthday only eight days before Harry's. A couple awesome things happened on Harry's birthday over the years. On July 31st, 2011, J.K. Rowling celebrated by opening registration for Pottermore, which is now Wizarding World. On July 31st, 2016, the book adaptation of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child was released. To celebrate Harry's birthday, Jess and I asked you guys to share with us on social media what Harry's character means to you. I'm going to read some of your messages. Maddie says, he is the perfect example of what love, friendship, family, bravery, perseverance, and much more is. Aza says, he taught me about friendship, not only how to make friends, but retain friends. He taught me to stand up by my friends and they will do the same. Fame is nothing compared to friendship. Alexandra says, means the absolute world to me. Sam says, Harry's character taught me to always stand up for yourself, never stop being brave, fight for what you believe in, and there's always light at the end of the tunnel. What a character and what a set of stories. I love Harry Potter so much. And finally, Estelle says, Harry taught me perseverance, how to overcome hardship, and how to do the best with the hands you're dealt. At the end of the day, he survived the darkest wizard of all time, and that's no small thing. He was just a teenager, a 17-year-old, who was needlessly targeted by a 70-something-year-old man for surviving death. Harry is an amazing character, and I will forever stay in love with the universe because of him. Thank you so much for sharing what Harry's character means to you. He truly touches the hearts of millions. In the series, Harry has eventful birthdays from his 11th when he finds out he's a wizard to his 17th when he comes of age. And now, let's celebrate Harry's special day by diving into his birthday highlights, presents, and much more. Now, it's time to dive into the book topic of the week for tales of magic and mischief. It's Harry birthday time. So we're going to start off in Sorcerer's Stone on his 11th birthday. So a week leading up to his birthday on July 24th is when Harry got his first Hogwarts letter, but he didn't get to look at it. And during this entire week, the letters keep coming and the Dursleys keep, you know, taking them away. So Harry has no idea who the letter writer is and what these letters are. So on the night before his 11th birthday, the Dursleys find themselves in the shack on the rock, surrounded by water, and this shack is smelling of seaweed, the wind is whistling through the gaps in the walls, and the fireplace is damp and empty, there's a storm raging on outside, so it's not an awesome place to be. It's also super small, there's only two rooms, and it's super cold. So Harry is kind of on the floor by himself with the smallest and thinnest blanket. He's freezing, he's hungry, and he's looking at Dudley's watch, watching his birthday tick nearer, and he's wondering if the Dursleys will even acknowledge his birthday birthday that year and he's also wondering where the letter writer is now. So as he's counting down, he's like having all these thoughts and then all of a sudden when it strikes midnight, there's a big boom and I said this is New Year's 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> he has such a miserable existence before he goes to Hogwarts and this is like a huge representation of that, right? They treat him like he's nothing but a piece of garbage that they basically have to carry around with them. And this is evident in the fact that he has nothing to eat and he's cold. Think about this, right? You have a miserable existence and all of a sudden your life is about to change for the better and you don't know it yet. This is typical of a fantasy novel. Yes, it totally is. And we're about to meet somebody who really does care about Harry. 
Hagrid comes in and gives Harry a chocolate cake with Happy Birthday Harry written on it in green icing. And he also gives him his Hogwarts letter. And this is when Harry finds out that he's a wizard. The Dursleys are like not happy about this at all. And Uncle Vernon takes it one step too far when he insults Dumbledore by saying, I am not paying for some crackpot old fool to teach him magic tricks. Hagrid gets super angry about this and he pulls his fantastic umbrella move and gives Dudley the pigtail, which is an extra birthday gift to Harry. This is quite literally my favorite part of the beginning of Sorcerer's Stone because, I mean, you're not supposed to use magic to curse people, but at the same time, if Harry had known Dumbledore, he would have given his cousin the pigtail also. 100%, yeah. (laughs) So Harry's 11th birthday is when he starts to really learn about the wizarding world. He goes to Diagon Alley, and when he's at the Leaky Cauldron, this is when he realizes how famous he truly is because all the wizards are falling all over him. So once in Diagon Alley, he goes to Gringotts and goes to his vault and learns that his parents left him a small fortune, which is just fantastic because Harry had literally nothing until now. And really, this was sitting here for, what, 11 years? So he's basically been, like, a little bit wealthy-ish for 11 years without even knowing because the Dursleys treated him like crap. Yeah, and what's even greater is that since the Dursleys are muggles, they can't use this money, (laughs) so they can't even profit off of what Harry has. I know, that's fantastic. I didn't think about that. But other highlights of his trip to Diagon Alley include him getting his Hogwarts robes. He goes to Florian Fortescue's ice cream shop and gets chocolate and raspberry ice cream with chopped nuts. Which, um, just personally, I would not like this. Just give me vanilla with syrup, please. (laughs) Yeah, I'm very plain, too. Like, I love vanilla ice cream just dipped in chocolate. Uh Uh-huh. He also buys parchment and quills and this awesome bottle of ink that changes colors while you write. That's so cool. I want one of those. That is really cool. I also like the feel of parchment and the fact that you can hear the quill scratching on it is just so cool. Harry also buys his school books, other class supplies, and most of all his magic wand, which he was most excited for. But Harry gets a real birthday present from Hagrid when he gives Harry his snowy owl, Hedwig. I love Hedwig. She is such a great companion for him throughout the series, not only because she accompanies him while he's at the Dursleys, but also because she's, like, really smart, and she's able to find Sirius when he's in hiding and bring him letters back and forth from Sirius, which is really awesome. Yeah, and Hedwig is literally Harry's constant tie to the wizarding world. And also, I kind of think that she can be seen as, like, an owl version of Harry because she can get, like, super, like, angry and annoyed and, like, petty sometimes. (laughs) I feel like Harry can be the same way. Yeah, and also, like, I love when the tropical birds come when Sirius is in hiding and she doesn't want to share her cage. (laughs) (laughs) After this amazing day, Hagrid takes Harry to the train station to go back to the Dursleys. Sigh. But Hagrid does give him an envelope with his train ticket to Hogwarts. He's to leave from platform nine and three quarters on September 1st. So honestly, this was Harry's first awesome birthday. And it's really sad because birthdays are something that kids look forward to. And the fact that he's 11 years old and hasn't had a good birthday until this point is just heartbreaking. But I'm happy he finally had an awesome one and is about to enter the magical world where he belongs. Yeah, I mean, the 17th birthday is becoming a wizard, but the 11th birthday is really important because you're on the road to becoming a wizard. And this is also the first time that most people enter school in the wizarding world, whereas Harry has had some muggle education beforehand. So in some ways, I guess he's ahead of the game. Yeah, when you said, follow the road to becoming a wizard, (laughs) my head is like, follow the yellow brick road. (laughs) Follow the yellow brick road. road. (laughs) Follow, 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 follow Follow the the yellow brick road. road. (laughs) (laughs) It's actually follow the wizarding road, but nobody told us that. So now moving on to Chamber of Secrets. After Harry's awesome 11th birthday, his 12th, is not so great. Literally, the first chapter of the book is called The Worst Birthday. 
So we have a typical morning in the Dursleys household. Uncle Vernon is telling Harry off about Hedwig because she's making noise and she's stuck in her cage because Uncle Vernon isn't allowing her to fly to send letters and everything. So Hedwig is not in a good mood as would be expected. Um, and also during breakfast, Dudley wants more bacon. So he asked Harry to past the frying pan and Harry is like you've forgotten the magic word and everyone's like freaking out Dudley actually like falls off his chair <laughs> um <laughs> and <laughs> like honestly he only meant please but Uncle Vernon's like what did I tell you about saying the m word in this house so they're furious this is my favorite thing they're so <laughs> scared of magic and i guess they ought to be because every time a wizard comes into their house like something <laughs> nutty happens <laughs> but i mean they had it coming toward them because they're not good people at all so yeah they totally deserve it but harry has a moment of total disbelief when uncle vernon starts talking at that moment uncle vernon cleared his throat importantly and said now as we all know today is a very important day Harry looked up, hardly daring to believe it. This could well be the day I make the biggest deal of my career, said Uncle Vernon. Harry went back to his toast. Of course, he thought bitterly, Uncle Vernon was talking about the stupid dinner party. He'd been talking of nothing else for two weeks. Some rich builder and his wife were coming to dinner and Uncle Vernon was hoping to get a huge order out of him. Uncle Vernon's company made drills. So this is just super sad because Harry literally thought for the first time ever that Uncle Vernon was going to actually acknowledge his birthday. But no, he's being selfish as always. This is so true. I mean, who would like a guy whose face is described as purple? <laughs> like, his face is purple and his mustache takes up most of it. Like, I literally just see like a purple blob on top of his neck with like small <laughs> eyes and like a big mustache. Like, that's how I picture it. <laughs> And Aunt Petunia is always described as being horse face, which, how? <laughs> I don't know. Like, and she has a long neck, right? She has a long neck and he has, like, not, not a lot of neck. <laughs> That's, like, the first thing they say about that. <laughs> so Uncle Vernon breaks into his big schedule, making sure that all the family members know where they're going to be that night when the Masons come. And everyone else is super hype. Harry is not. And when Uncle Vernon asks Harry where he'll be, he says... I'll be in my room making no noise and pretending I'm not there, which is just so terrible. Like, he is the coolest out of all of the four Dursleys, and yet he has to go upstairs. Like, that is so not cool. No, like, that's so rude. So Harry's feeling super down. He goes outside, and he's chilling by a hedge, and he starts to have these thoughts like, you know, like, no one cares about my birthday, no one sent me letters, and he starts to kind of wonder if the whole Wizarding World was just made up in his head because, you know, no one had any contact with him. And he even wishes that he could see Draco Malfoy just to make sure the whole thing was real and not fake. So he's staring into this hedge when he sees green eyes, which we know to be Dobby's. Um, but before he can really think too much about it, Dudley waddles over and starts to be rude. So Dudley says he knows what day it is. Well done, said Harry. You finally learned the days of the week. Today's your birthday, sneered Dudley. How come you haven't got any cards? Haven't you even got friends at that freak place? Harry's still staring at the hedge at this point and Dudley gets super suspicious. So he asked him what he's looking at and Harry has the best response. I'm trying to decide what would be the best spell to set it on fire. Dudley gets super freaked out and goes off about how, you know, dad will kick you out if you do magic. You're not allowed to do magic and you have nowhere to go because you don't have any friends, blah, blah, blah. But Harry's not done messing around with him, which I wouldn't be either because messing around with Dudley would probably be like my number one favorite hobby if I was Harry at home during the summer. So this is what Harry says. Chiggery pokery, hocus pocus, squiggly wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dudley freaks out. He's like, Mom, he's doing it again. And like, 
These aren't even real spells, and it's so funny. And Aunt Petunia gets so mad. She tried to hit him in the head with a frying pan, which is child abuse, but okay, like, not cool. Um, and she punishes him and sets him to work to do a bunch of things. And until everything's done, he's not going to eat again, which is just such an abusive thing. Like, I cannot with this at all. You know, it's like when you mess up when you're a kid and your mom sends you to your room without dinner. That's one thing. But then, like, saying, oh, you can't eat until you do all these chores, which is basically until the end of the day, which is basically when dinner comes and he can't eat with them, is just, like, really bad. Yeah, so let's see what Harry is forced to do. Harry has to clean the windows, wash the car, mow the lawn, trim the flower beds prunes and waters the roses and repaints the garden bench can i also mention that it's like a million degrees outside hair is sweating he's exhausted and he's forced to do all of this when he's literally 12 years old yeah i mean and why the heck does he have to wash the car right <laughs> they're not driving anywhere why is that a chore <laughs> like they just know. have to admire how shiny it is like this doesn't make any sense <laughs> oh my god so after all this and Harry finally goes back inside, the only thing he gets to eat is two slices of bread and a lump of cheese. That's it. Harry's sent back up to his room and this is where we meet Dobby who's just chilling out on Harry's bed. Uh, it gets super awkward because Dobby is trying to warn Harry about the Chamber of Secrets, but because he has been forbidden by the Malfoys to speak of this, he's forced to punish himself every time he tries to open his mouth. So he's punishing himself, and it's very loud, and Uncle Vernon comes up like, what are you doing? Like, blah, 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 super mad. Um, and Harry's like, I have to go back to Hogwarts. Like, it's my home and everything. Dobby's like, you know, like, you don't even have friends there. Friends that don't even write to Harry Potter. And Harry's like, how do you know that? And all of the letters that have been sent to Harry are hidden under the pillowcase that Dobby wears. So he's been swiping these letters this entire time. Harry gets super mad. He's like, get those back to me. Dobby's like, no. And Dobby runs downstairs. Harry's chasing after him. And Dobby, to make sure Harry, you know, stays away from Hogwarts, uses the hover charm on Aunt Petunia's pudding and makes it crash on the kitchen floor. And obviously, you know, Harry gets his warning from the Ministry of Magic that any more magic outside of school while he's underage could possibly lead to his expulsion at Hogwarts. And also it warns Harry to, you know, not do magic in front of muggles because it is a serious offense under the statute of secrecy. Um, but can we just kind of appreciate Dobby for ruining Uncle Vernon's deal here? Because once the barn hour flew in with the letter, um, Mrs. Mason freaks out because she's afraid of birds and Mr. Mason like follows after her like super mad so this ruined the whole deal which I love. What's even more fantastic about this is that Harry inadvertently did this to his to the Dursleys like he was being a good boy for once and what do you know Havoc just follows Harry and also let's appreciate Dobby because he really cares about Harry even though he like barely knows him and he's really trying to save Harry's life, which is pretty awesome for a house elf. I mean, house elves are trained to do what they're told, and Dobby obviously doesn't like that whole situation because he actually cares about other people aside from the Malfoys, which is awesome and rare for a house elf. Yeah, we love Dobby, but there's one kind of negative side to this whole thing because now the Dursleys know that Harry can't use magic outside school. Until this point, Harry kept that, you know, secret so he can taunt them and everything, but now they know. So Uncle Vernon threatens to lock Harry in his room and tells him that he's never going back to Hogwarts again, which we know, you know, turns out okay because the Weasleys come to save him, but... You know, this is a terrible 12th birthday compared to his 11th. It is pretty terrible. And let's face it, throughout the books, Harry doesn't have that many good birthdays. No. I would say his top ones are his 11th and his 17th, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. 
All right, now we're going to talk about Harry's 13th birthday in Prisoner of Azkaban. At the start of each summer, the Dursleys lock all of Harry's magical possessions and spell books and everything in the cupboard under the stairs. And this summer is not a good thing because Harry has homework he needs to do over the summer. But this all comes to be okay when the Dursleys go out into the garden to admire Uncle Vernon's new company car. And Harry creeps downstairs, picks a lock, gets some of his spell books, goes upstairs, and hides them under a floorboard in his room. So Harry is working on an essay for History and Magic, our least favorite class, and he gets super tired and looks at his alarm clock and realizes that it's 1 in the morning, meaning that he's been 13 for a whole hour without noticing it. Yet another unusual thing about Harry was how little he looked forward to his birthdays. He had never received a birthday card in his life. The Dursleys had completely ignored his last two birthdays and he had no reason to suppose they would remember this one. He's literally 13 and still hasn't had the proper birthday celebration with presents and cards and everything, which is so sad. Yeah, it's really terrible. I mean, that's what children are supposed to look forward to is their birthday because they get cake and ice cream and they see their friends and Harry gets none of that. But this is the birthday that changes it all because while Harry is feeling super down, three owls fly through his window and it's Hedwig a tawny owl from Hogwarts, and they're both holding up Errol because Errol's unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love Errol. <laughs> Poor thing. So Harry grabs Errol's package first, which is from Ron, and inside the brown paper, there is a present wrapped in gold, and there's also a newspaper clipping from the Daily Prophet and a letter. So Harry looks at the newspaper clipping first. The article talks about how Arthur won the annual grand prize galleon draw from the ministry, which is 700 galleons. And I said, the Weasleys deserve this. Yes, yes, yes. They really do. Like, I want to go with them on their trip. (laughs) That would have been so cool. Yeah. So in the article, there's a picture that shows all nine Weasleys smiling and waving at the camera from in front of Pyramids in Egypt, where they took a trip because Bill works there as a curse breaker for Gringotts and they went to visit. So awesome. I want to go to Egypt. (laughs) That'd be so cool to go into the tombs and see like real mummies. That'd be really cool. Yeah, I've always been like super fascinated by like Egyptian mythology and like the Egyptian culture in general. I thought the ancient Egyptians were cool. Harry reads Ron's letter and he starts off by apologizing for the phone call that went so bad earlier in the summer when he was like screaming. And by the way, they call them felly tones, which is fantastic. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he apologizes for that complete failure. Then he talks about their time in Egypt and says he can't believe that Arthur won the Galleon draw. Ron ends his letter by asking Harry if he'll be able to come to London before school starts to get their things. And there's a PS that says Percy became head boy, which who cares? That's why it's a PS. Like, (laughs) it was an afterthought. (laughs) So Harry unwraps Ron's gift and it's a sneakoscope. (laughs) And Ron's letter or little note that comes with this is awesome. Harry, this is a pocket sneakoscope. If there's someone untrustworthy around, it's supposed to light up and spin. Bill says it's rubbish sold for wizard tourists because it kept lighting up at dinner last night. But he didn't realize Fred and George had put beetles in his soup. (laughs) 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 That's great. I love it. So then Harry moves on to the package that Hedwig brought, and this is from Hermione. So I love how Hermione's letter is literally a mirrored image of Ron. So she starts off by talking about Ron's phone call and kind of says, like, I hope that didn't turn out very bad. I hope you're okay, Harry. (laughs) Um, Then she talks about how she's spending her holiday in France, and she's very, very jealous of how Ron is in Egypt because she heard that the Egyptian wizards were super fascinating. She also mentions how she was happy when Hedwig showed up because Hermione didn't know how she'd send her present to Harry from France. And she thinks that Hedwig just wanted to make sure that Harry got something for his birthday for a change, which we should all stand Hedwig. I love Hedwig. She's great. 
Like, she just knows exactly what Harry needs all the time. Hermione also says that she has been getting the Daily Prophet to keep up with the Wizarding World, and that she's also been learning some interesting stuff in France because they have a local magic history that she thinks is super fascinating, and she even rewrote her whole history and magic essay to include some things that she learned. Classic Hermione. And she ends her letter like Ron, hoping that Harry will be able to meet them in Diagon Alley the week before school starts, and her P.S. is also that Percy was made head boy and Ron doesn't seem too happy about it, which we agree, Ron. I mean, I wouldn't be happy either. <laughs> <laughs> so then Harry opens Hermione's present and it is a broom servicing kit. So Harry is like, yes, Hermione, this is fantastic. And let's see what this kit includes. There was a large jar of Fleetwood's high finish handle polish. A pair of gleaming silver tail twig clippers, a tiny brass compass to clip on your broom for long journeys, and a handbook of do-it-yourself broom care. Hermione absolutely nailed it with her present because we all know how much Harry loves Quidditch. I really like this present because it is something that Harry can use for years to come, and I think Hermione was really smart in giving that to him. Plus, like, it's really cool. I mean, polishing your broom sounds kind of fun. So lastly, the package from Hogwarts is from Hagrid, and Harry starts to open it, and he glimpses something green and leathery when it, like, starts to snap at him and quivers. Harry gets super nervous because we all know how much Hagrid loves dangerous magical creatures. So Harry (laughs) grabs his lamp, holds it over his head, ready to, like, swipe out whatever is inside of this package. Harry rips open the package and a book falls out. It's green and in gold letters it says, The Monster Book of Monsters. This book starts scutting all around his bed and it falls onto the floor and it's shuffling around. Harry's like, what the heck is happening? Like, it looks like a crab. Oh my god. And so the book like hides in like the corner under his desk and Harry goes over to it and the thing like straight up bites him and it starts to like go scuttling around again and Harry like throws himself on the book flattens it and uses a belt to buckle it shut the book is like not happy about this at all but in Hagrid's note he says that the book will be useful but he's not going to say anything more about it just then and he also hopes the muggles are treating him right If you think about it, this book is kind of (laughs) cute. Like, it's an actual monster (laughs) that talks about monsters. Like, that's so cute and ingenious. I also love how Hagrid's like, don't you people know how to open this book? You Uh, just stroke the spine. You gotta stroke him. And then Draco's like, oh, I should have guessed. Like, how did we not know you just had to stroke (laughs) this book? (laughs) And the book is kind of cute. Like, it's kind of shy, you know, because it hides from him. Yeah. It's kind of cute. It's, it's cute. Definitely something that, it's definitely something that Hagrid would, like, keep in his hut yeah. just to, like, play with all the time. <laughs> or, like, it would, it would be really funny if, like, we actually saw it in Hagrid's hut and, like, Fang was running after it. <laughs> like, and didn't know what it was. I probably thought it was a toy or something. <laughs> Along with this package from Hogwarts, Harry also got his book list and the usual welcome back letter to students. And also enclosed in the envelope is the Hogsmeade permission form because third years are allowed to go to the village. So Harry kind of gets a little twinge of sadness here because... He's like, how am I going to get Uncle Vernon to sign this? But he doesn't dwell on it too long because for the first time ever, he got presents and he falls asleep facing his birthday cards. But when he wakes up in the morning, the Dursleys give him the worst present ever because they tell him that Aunt Marge is coming and Harry just does not like her and Aunt Marge doesn't like him, so it's not good. But Harry gets this grand plan to blackmail Uncle Vernon into signing the form, basically saying if he'll sign it uncle vernon will not have to worry about harry you know spilling major tea about him being a wizard because harry promised that he'll be a good boy and keep his mouth shut as long as uncle vernon will sign this form but obviously we know this doesn't turn out right because harry ends up blowing her up which is fantastic but um yeah so harry's 13th birthday isn't awful 
I think it's probably one of the better ones. It's more chill. He gets presents for the first time. Nothing super bad happens. So yeah, his 13th birthday is a good one. Yeah, and the fact that he flees the scene after she blows up is great. He's like, goodbye, and then he goes <laughs> on the night bus. Yeah. So yeah, I, th- I would rank this one as one of his top, as like his top three. Yeah. 11, 13, and 17, 17 are like the top three. Yeah, definitely. Harry's 14th birthday in Goblet of Fire isn't that memorable, but it is a really funny one. So this is the summer that Dudley is told that he's basically really fat, and... <laughs> <laughs> he has to be put on a diet. <laughs> and so the fridge is filled with fruits and vegetables and the sort of things that Uncle Vernon called rabbit food. This diet is so strict that they can barely eat any food all day. So one morning for breakfast, Harry and the Dursleys each get a grapefruit quarter. Harry's grapefruit quarter is smaller than Dudley's because Aunt Petunia is trying to boost Dudley's morale by giving him more to eat, even though more to eat is just a slightly larger quarter of grapefruit, so I don't think this strategy is really working, but anyways. So then, Harry sends out a plea for help to everybody in the Wizarding World because he's starving again. Hermione sends him some sugar-free snacks because her parents are dentists, and Hagrid sends him some inedible rock cakes, which really don't help the situation very much. But Mrs. Weasley, as usual, saves the day. She sends Errol with a fruit cake and assorted meat pies. As usual, the Dursleys forget Harry's birthday, but everybody else important didn't. Ron, Hermione, Hagrid, and Sirius each send Harry a birthday cake, both as a present and to make sure that Harry doesn't starve to death. The book also mentions that Harry receives birthday cards from Ron and Hermione. Harry's 14th birthday is super short, but I think it's hysterical because of the whole diet that Dudley's on, and it's important for him to remember that there are people who care about him and who are willing to feed him and send him food. Plus, like, who doesn't want to eat four giant birthday cakes? Like, that's awesome. Yeah, as the series goes on, you just see how this select group of people, you know, Ron, Hermione, the rest of the Weasleys and Hagrid, they truly do care about Harry. And they would go to any lengths to make sure he's happy, healthy, whatever. Um, And they're very important people in his life. So I love, even though this is short, like you said, I love how we do see them come through for him here. Yeah, I completely agree. So from Harry's 13th through 17th birthdays, we really start to see that he has a huge support system around him. This is really important for a boy who's growing up because outside of the Dursleys, he didn't have anything until he went to Hogwarts. Yeah, and it's also super important because he's Harry Potter. Like, he's not a normal wizard. He has this constant pressure and this fame and... It's very important, especially for him, to know that he has these people in his life that truly do care about him. Right, and the path that he's on, he can't really walk the road alone. No. Nobody really can. So that's why I love these books, too, because it shows love and friendship at its finest. Definitely. In Order of the Phoenix, Harry again spends his birthday at the Dursleys. After Voldemort returns to his body, Harry is super anxious about news from the Wizarding World. Like, this crazy stuff happened at the end of Goblet, and here he is sitting at the Dursleys wondering what's going on. Well, Ron and Hermione don't really help the situation much because they don't send him any news because they think that the owls that they send might get intercepted. This makes Harry feel even more isolated from the magical community than he usually felt at the Dursleys. Also, Harry was really hoping that he would see Ron and Hermione that summer, and the letters that they send didn't give him an exact date for when they were gonna come see him. Hermione had scribbled, I expect we'll be seeing you quite soon, inside his birthday card. But how soon was soon? As far as Harry could tell from the vague hints in their letters, Hermione and Ron were in the same place, presumably at Ron's parents' house. He could hardly bear to think of the pair of them having fun at the burrow when he was stuck in Privet Drive. In fact, he was so angry at them that he had thrown both their birthday presents of Honeyduke's chocolates away unopened, though he had regretted this after eating the wilting salad Aunt Petunia had provided for dinner that night. I don't really blame Harry here because he's 15, 
He's a moody teenager. And after he went through something so traumatic, he's literally stuck by himself. He can't talk to his friends about it. And this just shows your typical teenager, like, reaction that's super impulsive without much thought behind it. Like, he's also jealous, too, because he's stuck in a crappy situation when he's like, oh, they must be together, they must be having fun without me, that, that kind of stinks, you know? You would hate to feel excluded at that age, because, I mean, at that age, friends are everything, and without them, you just feel really alone. Oh, yeah, definitely. Also, since Voldemort's rising, Harry wants to be involved with whatever is going on with the Weasleys. Like, he feels like he needs to be. I mean, he was the one who was there, after all. But obviously, he's stuck here, so that makes things worse as well. At the same time, Sirius is sending him letters with words of caution, telling him not to do anything rash. And Harry actually follows this advice, which is awesome, because usually he doesn't do that. Luckily, Harry's inner torment doesn't last long, because a couple days later, Lupin, Tonks, Moody, and other members of the Order escort Harry to number 12, Grimmauld Place where he gets the 411 about what the order is and their plans to stop Voldemort. This is a whole pattern of wizards coming to save Harry from the Dursleys. In Chamber of Secrets, we have Fred, George, and Ron come rescue him in the flying car. In Goblet, we have the awesome scene when Arthur blasts the Dursleys' fireplace. In this one, we have the order saving him. Half-Blood, Dumbledore saves him. And then in Deathly Hallows, the whole crew comes to get him. So, they're literally constantly saving him from the Dursleys. Harry has to be at the Dursleys because of his mother's protective charm, but as long as he's only there for a little bit of time, he can still call it home, and I think that's what Dumbledore finally realized later, and that's why he's allowing people to come rescue Harry. Still, this kind of stinks because most of his birthdays are spent at the Dursleys, so his pivotal moments in growing up are not the best in some of these books, which makes me sad. Yeah, no, super sad. On Harry's 16th birthday in Half-Blood Prince, he is spending time at the borough, which, if you think about it, his 16th and 17th birthdays are not at the Dursleys, so that makes things a little bit better. At this time, the Death Eaters are at large, and so is Voldemort, and they are wreaking havoc across London. On his birthday, they are all sitting around the dinner table. To Mrs. Weasley's displeasure, Harry's 16th birthday celebrations were marred by grisly tidings brought to the party by Remus Lupin, who was looking gaunt and grim, his brown hair streaked liberally with gray, his clothes more ragged and patched than ever. There have been another couple of Dementor attacks, he announced as Mrs. Weasley passed him a large slice of birthday cake, and they found Igor Karkaroff's body in a shack up north. The dark mark had been set over it. Well, frankly, I'm surprised he stayed alive for even a year after deserting the Death Eaters. Sirius's brother, Regulus, only managed a few days as far as I can remember. So, this quote is important because it's foreshadowing here. We all know what happened to Regulus, and that's what we'll find out in later books. Now, before Mrs. Weasley can persuade them to change the subject, Bill asks Remus if he's heard about Florian Fortescue, the guy who ran the ice cream place in Diagon Alley. Harry said that Florian used to give him free ice creams and asked what happened to him. Bill replied, dragged off by the look of his place. Then when Ron asks why, Mrs. Weasley glares at Bill for talking about something unhappy on Harry's birthday. But Bill doesn't take the hint, so he answers Ron. Who knows? He must have upset them somehow. He was a good man, Florine. Now, it's Mr. Weasley's turn to pipe in, and he says that Ollivander's gone, too. The wand maker? said Jenny, looking startled. That's the one. Shop's empty. No sign of a struggle. No one knows whether he left voluntarily or was kidnapped. When the question is posed about what they'll do for wands, Lupin replies that they can go to another maker, but since Ollivander is the best, it's not good that Voldemort has him. So as gloomy as this conversation is, it's important because there is foreshadowing not only to Regulus, but also about Ollivander. And think about it, okay? So if, if Voldemort has Ollivander in six, by the time they get to him in seven, he's been in prison for a really long time. Like, that's terrible. 
Yeah, I also think it's very important because Molly here is wanting Harry to have the best birthday possible. Despite the dark times and despite these super disturbing stories being shared, Molly cares for Harry so much that she had it in her head like, okay, I want to try to make this the best night ever for him. So I love Molly. Let's move into Deathly Hollows. The final and last birthday of Harry's is his most important one, his 17th birthday. He is now of age. At this time, Harry was staying at the borough with the Weasleys, and the day after his birthday was Bill and Fleur's wedding. When Mrs. Weasley asked Harry about his birthday after the Golden Trio finished cleaning the chicken coop, Harry requested that Mrs. Weasley make a simple dinner so as to not put more strain on her since she was busy with wedding preparations. She suggests inviting Remus, Tonks, and Hagrid, and Harry agreed. On the morning of his birthday, Harry woke up from a dream where Voldemort was walking toward a small village cradled in a deep valley, looking for Gavorovich. At this point, Ron wakes Harry up and the boys talk a little bit about who they think Gavorovich might be. Then Harry realizes what day it is and he decides to celebrate by doing some unnecessary magic. Harry sees the wand lying beside his camp bed, pointed it at the cluttered desk where he had left his glasses, and said, Accio glasses! Although they were only around a foot away, there was something immensely satisfying about seeing them zoom toward him, at least until they poked him in the eye. Slick, snorted Ron. Reveling in the removal of his trace, Harry sent Ron's possessions flying around the room, causing Pigwidgeon to wake up and flutter excitedly around his cage. Harry also tried tying the laces of his trainers by magic. The resultant knot took several minutes to untie by hand, and purely for the pleasure of it, turned the orange robes on Ron's Chudley Cannon's posters bright blue. I do your fly by hand, though, Ron advised Harry, sniggering when Harry immediately checked it. This part is awesome. JK says purely for the pleasure of it, and I couldn't agree more. Like, if I had magic, I would use it for stupid things all the time. Like, that's just something any teenager would do. And, I mean, as an adult, you'd do that too. I'd also apparate into every room like Fred and George do. If I could use the Accio charm, I would literally summon everything to me. And I think it's absolutely hilarious that the first thing Harry does is like, Accio glasses, because obviously he needs his glasses, but because he doesn't actually have to get up and get them himself, he's going to do it by magic, which is super accurate. I totally do the same thing. But it's really funny, though, because it backfires on him. <laughs> but honestly, though, if it was me, I'd be Accioing my phone all the time. I lose my phone pretty much every day. Yeah, me too. Ron gives Harry a hilarious birthday present that he has to open in their bedroom away from Mrs. Weasley. Ron explains, It's pure gold, 12 fail-safe ways to charm witches. Explains everything you need to know about girls. If only I'd had this last year, I'd have known exactly how to get rid of lavender, and I would have known how to get going with, well, Fred and George gave me a copy, and I've learned a lot. You'd be surprised. It's not all about wand work, either. I need somebody to write that for How to Charm Boys. I need that. ASAP. I mean, honestly, as a teenage boy, you really do want to learn everything you need to know about women so that you can get a date. And this is just a rite of passage. Also, Ron has an emotional range of a teaspoon, so he really needs this book. Yeah, boys think girls are complicated, but literally boys are the complicated ones. And with Ron's inability to understand people's emotions, I couldn't imagine him trying to get a girl. I cannot. Then Ron and Harry go downstairs to find Bill and Mr. Delacour eating and Mrs. Weasley talking to them while she cooks. Mrs. Weasley said that Mr. Weasley wished Harry a happy birthday and that Mr. Weasley had to leave early for work, but he'll be home for dinner later that night. Harry sits down in front of a pile of presents and he opens the parcel that Mrs. Weasley said was from them. In the parcel is a watch similar to the one that Ron's parents gave him when he turned 17. It was gold with stars circling around the face instead of hands. It's traditional to give a wizard a watch when he comes of age, said Mrs. Weasley, watching him anxiously from beside the cooker. 
I'm afraid that one isn't new like Ron's. It was actually my brother Fabian's, and he wasn't terribly careful with his possessions. It's a bit dented on the back, but the rest of her speech was lost. Harry had got up and hugged her. He tried to put a lot of unsaid things into the hug, and perhaps she understood them because she patted his cheek clumsily when he released her, then waved her wand in a slightly random way, causing half a pack of bacon to flop out of the frying pan onto the floor. I absolutely love the fact that Mrs. Weasley gave him such an important gift, and the fact that it's old and a little dented and not in perfect condition doesn't matter to Harry at all. Just being given that special present by the people who he considers to be his family is just the most beautiful thing, and I love his interaction with Molly here. I just want to point out here that the Weasleys didn't even need to give Harry a gift because they risked their lives trying to get Harry to the burrow. They have always been there for Harry as a family, and that is more than enough to Harry. He doesn't care about material possessions at all. Like, the people around him are pure gold as far as he's concerned. Absolutely, and that shows too in the fact that he didn't need an elaborate dinner when Mrs. Weasley asked him. Like, he isn't that person to feel selfish and want a big celebration. Just being there with them is more than enough for him. Plus, the emotion that he pours into the hug, I mean, he also feels a little bit guilty because him and Ron are going into mortal peril, basically. And he's also trying to say, hey, I'm sorry, but for whatever this is worth, it was his choice. Yeah, absolutely. I also like how she holds up the tradition of giving a wizard a watch. Like, I don't understand it, but the fact that she's trying to make this day special is just the best thing ever. The rest of the presents included a sneakoscope from Hermione, an enchanted razor from Bill and Fleur, chocolates from the Delacours, and an enormous box of Weasley Wizard Wheezes merchandise from the twins. The kitchen gets more crowded and the trio leaves, and Hermione takes Harry's stuff from him so she can pack it. I love how Hermione is literally packing his birthday presents on the big trip. Like, that's, I love Hermione, like, oh, we're gonna pack your gifts. They're gonna help us destroy Voldemort. That's 100% accurate. I'm also pretty sure that she says something here about waiting for Ron's underpants to get out of the wash. Yeah. <laughs> so then Ginny beckons Harry into her room. Ooh. Ow! <laughs> 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 we stand, Ginny. We stand, Ginny. So this is the tragically romantic moment. Ginny says she couldn't think of what to get him for his birthday, she couldn't think of anything useful, and she couldn't get him something so big that he couldn't take it with him. Then she says, So then I thought, I'd like you to have something to remember me by. You know, if you meet some Vila when you're off doing whatever you're doing. When Harry assures her that there won't be any dating opportunities where he's going, she says, There's the silver lining I've been looking for, she whispered. And then they kiss. I love Ginny at this part because she does what I would do if my boyfriend was going into mortal danger. Like, I'd kiss him before he left, and I realized that he might not come back, but at least I got one last moment with him. Then Ron bangs open the door, followed by Hermione, and the trio awkwardly leave the bedroom. It's like when Ron reprimands Ginny for kissing Dean, like this is the exact same thing, except it's hella awkward because it's Harry. Yeah, I don't have an older brother, but I mean, technically I do have an older brother now. My brother-in-law, he was like my brother. He would probably do the same thing. I mean, that's just like an older brother thing. Yeah. So they get down to the backyard and Ron and Harry argue. Ron says that he doesn't want Harry to be stringing his sister along. Harry assures Ron that Jenny's not an idiot and that she knows it can't happen. They're not going to get married or anything. After this, Harry has a fantasy of Jenny marrying a faceless stranger and he realizes how unencumbered Jenny's future is, whereas his is fraught with danger, with Voldemort looming overhead. Spoiler alert, Harry! You're the faceless stranger that you saw in your own fantasy. But still, Harry then assures Ron that he won't go after Jenny again. And then Charlie arrives, and Mrs. Weasley cuts his hair. That evening, tables are set up end-to-end -end in the garden for the party. 
The twins bewitched a number of purple lanterns, all emblazoned with a large 17, to hang in midair over the guests. Hermione made purple and gold streamers erupt from the end of her wand and draped themselves artistically over the trees and bushes. She also turns the leaves on a crabapple tree to gold. Can we just take a moment and appreciate how pretty this is? I personally think that purple and gold is an awesome color combination. Gold is so bright and beautiful and purple is the color of royalty. So I love this whole atmosphere look. Yeah, and in a sense, Harry is royalty. I mean, he's very famous, so I guess you could say that he's royal. And gold also symbolizes riches, which I guess he is. He has a lot of money, but he's also rich in the things that matter, like friends and his good heart and mind. This is my favorite part! Mrs. Weasley comes out with a giant beach ball-sized snitch birthday cake that she suspends in midair with her wand. The cake lands in the middle of the table, and Harry tells her it looks amazing. Honestly, let's just admire how Mrs. Weasley is the best cook ever and how she's smart enough not to carry this thing in her hands. If it were me, I would have dropped it. Drop the ball. <laughs> oh my god, I've just got that. <laughs> you dropped the ball. Fred and George lead the guests in who appeared down the lane from the house, and by 7 p.m., it's party time. Hagrid comes in wearing his disgusting hairy brown suit. Lupin comes in and he seems unhappy, but Tonks looks radiant. Obviously, we know why, because Tonks is pregnant. So Hagrid reminds Harry that it's been six years to the day since they met and asks if he remembers it. Vaguely, said Harry, grinning up at him. Didn't you smash down the front door, give Dudley a pig's tail, and tell me I was a wizard? I forget the details, Hagrid chortled. I love this part because literally six years ago that day, Harry's life was not only changed, but he met one of the greatest people ever. I love Hagrid so much. Same, I feel like Hagrid is one of the most prominent father figures to Harry. Because he's been there from the beginning, like, yeah, Sirius was for a bit, Lupin can also be seen as one, but Hagrid was truly the one from the beginning who became, like, a father figure to him. I agree. Hagrid greets Ron and Hermione, and Hermione asks how he is, and Hagrid says he's been busy because there are new unicorns at the castle. He also says they'll see when they get there, but Harry avoids the other's gazes because we all know that they're not going back to Hogwarts. Hagrid rummaged in his pocket and he pulled out a present for Harry. He pulled out a small, slightly furry drawstring pouch with a long string, evidently intended to be worn around the neck. Moke skin. Hide anything in there and no one but the owner can get it out. They're rare, them. Harry thanks him and then Hagrid says it was nothing before waving him off and greeting Charlie. If you had one of those, what would you put in it? If I had one of those, I would shrink my wand down and put it in it, and if and when I get a significant other, I'm going to have a locket with our picture in there, and I'd put that in the pouch as well. When you said if and when, that hit me so freaking hard. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so any boys listening, just kidding. Yeah, I would totally do the same thing, and if I had a boyfriend, I would totally keep something super special in there that he gave me, and also, I'm super secretive with my music, and so I want people to hear it, so what I would do is I would write down my lyrics to new songs and string down the paper and hide it in there until I'm ready for people to hear. So then Hagrid asks Charlie about Norbert, and Charlie says that they call it Norberta now because it's a girl, and they know it's a girl because it's very vicious. I mean, but let's be real. Girls are way more vicious than guys. Come on. <laughs> when we get in our moods, you don't mess with us. End of story. The end. So before they can start dinner, Mr. Weasley's Patronus arrives, and he says he's coming with the minister. Tonks and Lupin both leave, and then Scrimger comes, and he says he needs a word with the trio, who accompany him to the sitting room. And then Dumbledore's will is read, and they receive the items that were left for them. Then they come back out and they pass the Deluminator, the Tales of Beetle the Bard, and the Snitch around the dinner table. I love when Scrimger gives Harry the Snitch and he's super suspicious about it. 
and wonders why Dumbledore left that for him. And Hermione says something like, oh, it can't be a reference to the fact that Harry's a great seeker. That's why his birthday cake's won. There must be something hidden in the icing. That is crazy because on the actual snitch that Harry gets, there is a secret message written on it. So Hermione totally figured it out before she even knew she figured it out. This is why I aspire to be Hermione. End of story. (laughs) I don't know if you guys remember the Deathly Hallows episode, but we talked about how Harry has the snitch and the game is over. Well, he gets the snitch in the beginning of this book, so it literally shows that the game is almost over. Like, the snitch has just been released. Yeah, this is like when the game's officially starting. Let the Hunger Games begin! (laughs) So, the celebration ends with a hasty meal, a rendition of Happy Birthday, and the consumption of Mrs. Weasley's amazing cake. Who ate the part that said, I open at the close? That's what I want to know. Aw, jeez. Hagrid leaves to set up a tent in a nearby field so that he can wake up and come to the wedding tomorrow, and the trio clean up with Mrs. Weasley before they agree to meet later that night in Ron's room to discuss the objects Dumbledore left them. Like Harry's 11th birthday, this birthday is probably one of the best, but unlike Harry's 11th birthday, Harry's 17th birthday shows that he's an adult now and that he has a lot of things he needs to do, so while it may be all happy... At the surface, there is underlying danger that Harry must face. Yeah, this is similar to what we are talking about in our Burrow episode, how we see the Burrow's atmosphere shift in relationship to the trio's lives and how they grew up. Because at the beginning of the series in Sorcerer's Stone, it was a blast at Diagon Alley. Harry found out he was a wizard, he had the time of his life, and then when he gets to five... He's an angsty teenager. And then in Deathly Hallows, when Harry turns 17, that is a big birthday because he comes of age. But at the same time, his birthday to him isn't a big deal. He doesn't need a big celebration like we talked about. Being with the people he loves is most important to him, especially because he's going off on this dangerous quest. So it's very interesting to look at these birthdays and see how they changed depending on how Harry grew up across the series. I agree, and as a reader who grew up with Harry, I just have to say that it was really sad coming to the end of Deathly Hallows because my childhood was over just like his was. We hope you guys enjoyed celebrating Harry's birthday with us. Let us know if you have any additional thoughts. Otherwise, we will see you for our next episode on August 14th. Thank you guys so much for listening again. Bye! Thank you for coming back to Hogwarts with us in this episode of Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library podcast. Hedwood's theme and leaving Hogwarts in this episode were originally composed by John Williams and arranged by your favorite Hufflepuff. Until next time, three, two, one, Knox.